Are you a resident trying to figure out how to tackle disability insurance? I know just one more thing to figure out on top of treating patients, taking call and making presentations. You're already stressed as a training physician. However, let's make this easy. Attend the Disability Insurance 101 webinar with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, where she will lay out the importance of disability insurance and all the questions that you can think of about disability insurance will be answered in this live webinar. And don't worry, if you're on call or have other responsibilities, this webinar will be recorded so you can revisit it. The link for registration is in the show notes. Once again, um, Disability Insurance 101 uh, for Residents webinar is made specifically for you. Why should you trust Dr. Stephanie Pearson? Because she's a physician just like you. She's been in the seat that you are in today. She's a disabled physician and she really takes pride with helping other physicians figure out the importance of getting covered before you complete residency. Act now. All right, welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. And we have another great episode and another very interesting guest for you and Amanda Hill, who is a, a lawyer, a healthcare lawyer with over 20 years, well over now, <laughs> 20 years <laughs> of experience. Uh, but what really caught my eye is her new initiative that she's taking on, the mission of protecting healthcare providers with Guard My Practice. So welcome to the show, Amanda. Thank you. So excited to be here and visit with you. Absolutely. So tell us, you know, that was a brief introduction, but tell us a little bit. I know that you're practicing, you're in Texas, but tell mm -hmm. us about your journey of becoming a lawyer and now kind of spinning off with what you're doing. Oh, yeah, sure. So back in the, I know I look so young, um, but in the early days of my practice, I started with the VA. And it was sort of like, you know how it is with any career. You start off, you know, uh, this is the only job I could get at the time, you know. And uh, once I started and getting the taste for reading medical records and working with physicians, I sort of got bit. And a lot of it is I really like working with doctors and not all lawyers do. <laughs> you know, I like getting my hands dirty. I like going in there in the rooms with them. I like dealing with these difficult patient issues. I left the VA and went to a really big medical group. It was a really nice shift. I've done it all. Big group, small group, FQHC. Now I have my own law firm. So I've been in-house, out-house, you know, no matter what house, I've probably visited your house. And so it's really fun because I feel like I know the life of a doctor really well. You know, I don't sit in a law firm and give lofty opinions and caveat everything, quote the statutes. I'm like, I know, and this sucks, and let's get you out of this jam, or let's figure this solution out now, and you don't want to hear it tomorrow. You need to call me at 6 a.m. before your shift. We need to talk it through, and I just find it exhilarating, so I've never looked back. I've done health law for a really long time, and I really enjoy this phase of my life because it's my firm. You know, I get to take the clients on that I want, and then, you know, I can sort of start these new creative endeavors, which feeds my creative side, so so it's a nice spot to be in. And thank you for what you do, because I really like helping our healers. That's what I like to say. Absolutely. And, you know, we're talking about that relationship between lawyer and physician. And many mm -hmm. times it's not that you don't feel like they're on your side. I'll speak from a health care oh, standpoint. I know. Because many times you're fighting a lawyer to take care of your patient. Or, you know, when you think lawyer, you're thinking malpractice or you're thinking lawsuits, but not mm -hmm. necessarily having somebody in your corner, which is what you're trying to do. So. You know, I think the work that you're doing is awesome. Well, thanks. I always like to say, I'm like, I, everyone needs me in their pocket, right? <laughs> if you're a white coat, you need me sticking in their pocket. Because, you know, a lot of times I act as a counselor, you know, to doctors, they call and they're like, what do I do about this situation? Or like, I don't know, should I sign this? Is this going to get me in trouble? Is this like a fraud deal? Or this patient's driving me nuts. And they just call and talk. And the good thing is it's all confidential and privileged. So they, it's like having someone that's truly your advocate I jokingly said to someone yesterday, I ghostwrite emails. Like nobody needs to know that you are calling your lawyer. Right? Right. Nobody needs to know that he didn't write that email, but someone else did, but you sound great. And right. so I like to make you look good. And that's my job is to be in the background, you know, helping you out, reading your contracts. Very, very often, nobody knows I exist, except for the people who pay my bills and they very much know I exist. But, <laughs> you know, if I'm reviewing your contract and I point out all the pitfalls and I tell you, look, you need to think about, you know, fighting these big time, big ticket issues. Don't sign this contract until you get this changed. Sometimes the doctors go and negotiate it themselves because they're empowered. They know what to you know, argue for. They're not getting their lawyer to do it. And nobody gets all lawyered up and it's not scary. And so I want to empower doctors to go do this stuff themselves, to try to know what they're looking at and reading. 
you know, just empowering with education because I tell you, I look at an EKG, I'm like, man, it just looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. I don't know what that means. It, I can't interpret it. I don't know what that means. Same with, you know, contracts. To me, it's so obvious and they make sense. And doctors say, I don't know what any of these words mean. Like it's another language. And so it's just, we just have to work together. And I explained it to them in layman's terms. A doctor just this morning said, what's a DBA? I've never, and I was like, oh, well, that's called a doing business as, you know, another name. And he was like, oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> so it's just explaining just like you do with your patients. And I love doing that with doctors because, you know, you're really good at what you do. You know, you can operate, you can diagnose, you can do differentials, you can write great notes. And yet you don't want to feel stupid, right? You don't want to right. be like, well, wow, I signed this deal. And that's the saddest part. Because when I have a client come to me and I'm like, I'm an idiot, man. I just spent $200,000. I invest in this deal. And the only way I can get out is if I get out for 10 bucks. You know, like, what was I thinking? Ah, this is my family's money. And so I just want doctors to not be in that situation. Yeah, no, like you said, a couple of things. <clears throat> Number one, I can't read EKGs either. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, okay, so. good. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, you know, you don't want to, many times you don't want to feel like an idiot. So you stay quiet. Right. And that's the worst thing you can do when you're dealing with contracts. Um, and the like worst. you mentioned, there is a language, just like orthopedics has a language that a mm -hmm. internal medicine doctor might not understand. Contracts have a language. And I'm sure it's the same different words and different paragraphs that you review over and over, no matter if you're working with a doctor or working with whomever, but until mm -hmm. you understand that language, it's like a foreign language. And you right. know, I'd, I'd admit like sometimes coming out of residency, my question was, hey, do I need a lawyer to look at this? And thank God somebody told me yes. And now yes. that anytime mm -hmm. someone comes to me and say, hey, I have this contract, should I get a lawyer to take a look at it? And the word, you know, it's absolutely you need to because- the most important thing on a contract is how you get out of it. And thank God someone told me that you know, <laughs> right, before right. my first job, because we really don't know what we don't know until many times it's too late. So let's I'm talk so glad about, you mentioned that. Yeah. I always talk about that. You know, where's the back door? Like, how yes. do you get out? Every single agreement you sign, medical director agreement, right? You know, how do you get out? What's the non-compete? You know, everyone thinks about the employment agreement and then they get someone to review that and then they sign seven other contracts in their career and they don't think that counts. Every contract you sign, you have to be able to get out of because things change so much in your career. And I had a doctor that came to me this week. It's a, it's a reputable group. He's a radiologist. He signed this contract and he was like, oh, well, can you just take a look at my non-compete to make sure, you know, I have to give them a certain amount of notice, I think, before I can get out. There was no way out of that thing. I could not believe he signed it. The only way he could get out of this contract is to wait until the five years ended or argue that the other side breached the contract and go through some big time penalty if he left early. And it was just nonsense. And I thought, oh my gosh, and you're a smart guy and you just didn't think about it. They told you it was standard. A lot of this is, you know, you believe what hospital systems and big groups tell you, right? If they say, oh, this is standard, the language, we don't change it. It's really fair. It's been vetted by legal. And you go, oh, okay, great. I don't have to spend that expense. You have no idea, right? That that's all not true. Or in some cases, right? Like, oh, the minute you start, man, we're going to spend money marketing you. We're going to build out this clinic. We're going to do all these things. And then you start. And I know, I know you know about this, um, but I had a client who moved to Houston, Texas, was promised the moon. He was a surgeon. Again, the, he was told work on your website for like two months. And suddenly finally he was like, I'm going to go broke. I mean, I'm paid on production. You know, this is ridiculous. So you just can't buy into those promises. You have to have contracts to protect you in a way out because so many things change. And I always like to tell people they're so worried about partnership, right? Oh, I want to be a partner. How do I become a partner? You know, I'm like, man, you got a date before you get married and you do not need to jump into partnership because there's a lot of funny things happen when you join with someone as a partner, right? You think they're good drinking buddy. You really think that you remember them maybe from residency. You have all these fond, you know, things to say. The minute you start working together, you might have completely different practice styles. They might be pushing the envelope on billing. You might have some concerns. You know, all these things come up and then you're like, why did I become a partner with this person? You know, I could have just worked for them for a year, realized I don't want to work with them. And then kindly left, you know, the stage left and wouldn't have been a problem. So that's something I really try to talk to doctors about. Think about the fact that in five years, your life might look a lot different. No, that's great advice. Um, absolutely. Because many times you think you know what you get into until you're actually mm -hmm. in it. 
And I'm, you know, as you're talking, my mind is just churning over here. I'm glad I left it, uh, just a completely empty blank piece of paper. Because, Yay! You know, one thing I want to talk about, we can, I think we can help the most people by talking about what a contract is and how to negotiate with a contract. But one thing that I thought about, you started your practice in an era where probably what, 80% of doctors were going into private practice. And now for the first time, we're in a phase where most people are going into an employed situation. Correct. How has that yeah. changed things for you? Oh, a lot. It is so scary, I think, for doctors to start their own practices. And it's even worse because, you know, you see your friends, you know, that pediatrician shut her practice down and that doctor tried to make an orthopod. It didn't work out. And so you, you get scared and you think, well, I can't do that. You know, I have to join this group and I don't have a choice. And let me tell you what I'm very passionate about. I don't like to see doctors feeling helpless. And that's one of the reasons they go into a big system, right? Is they feel helpless. Like I can't do it alone. The regulations are too hard. The fraud and abuse stuff scares me. If I get a government audit, I can be shut down. I'm trying to, to try to back up a little bit and try to talk to doctors again about starting their practice, but do it in a way that can really set them up for success. Because it makes me sad, to be honest. I hate it that everyone feels like they have to work for the man. Right. That well, I gotta sign the contract from you know a big hospital group because that's the only job in town. I I guess I'm stuck, or I guess this non-compete is just the way it is. And then all these helpless doctors are feeling bitter and resentful and like, well, I did all this work and now I have no control over my life. And that's what to me leads to the burnout is just a feeling of hopelessness. You know, I'm stuck. And man, we gotta change that. You know, we gotta get back to the day where you can hang a shingle again because it creates a lot of freedom. And to do that. One of that's that's a good foray into these videos, but one of the reasons that I started this company, it was about two years ago. I was sitting in my office drafting agreements for some complicated, you know, $10 million deal. And I thought, this isn't helping. Any lawyer can train up and, you know, edit these contracts, but I'm not getting there and helping doctors, right? This is COVID. You know, people were burned out. They were overworked. They were exhausted. And I was like, what am I doing? you know, to help the world. There's got to be a way where we can get in there and say to doctors, we're going to roll up our sleeves together. We're going to do this. You can go out on your own again. And so I became really passionate about, you know, trying to prevent the problems instead of just being on the back end and cleaning up the messes. And so I want to change the tide. I want doctors to start opening up their own practices again and not be scared. And part of the fear is of the unknown, you know, oh, well, it's too scary and overwhelming. I I couldn't possibly, how would it? You know, this is a funny personal story, but when I was working for an in-house for a federally qualified health center, I wanted to go out on my own because I knew I had the energy and the drive and the hustle, but I was so worried about health insurance. I just thought I cannot possibly have health insurance. I was like, you're putting your whole life on hold because you're worried about health insurance. And I was like, well, yeah, you know. And so once I realized that, ta-da, I can just buy health insurance, you know, like the world opened and I started my yeah. own firm and I had no clients, none, Zippo. I started with nothing. And that's very frightening because you feel like you're just jumping off a cliff and you're just going off your own charisma, your own skill. You believe in yourself. You know, it's hard to be the expert, right? I mean, if people go to you and say, you're the orthopedic expert, fix me. And you give advice like that is the end all be all. They trust you and your guidance. And I feel the same way with guidance that I give, you know, so you have to really be sure of yourself and that's hard. So I want to make sure that we get, I mean, I give free talks to residents all the time. I don't care if they pay me. I just want residents to go into the world and be ready, you know, for the stuff that comes. I feel like I'm, you know, the jaded cynical, like, just wait, you're going to see these things when you get in (laughs) practice, young whippersnapper, you know, because it's hard. It's really hard. And we've got to do better at educating these docs when they come out of training, so they don't feel so flooded, you know, when this stuff happens, because running a business is, you know, has a lot of component parts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do this. Let's talk about a contract and let's talk about some of the first things I'm going to talk to you kind of. Basically, from my first contract, what I will look at kind of to where I am now, and then we'll just kind of guide that through. But one thing when I look at a contract, I know one of the first things, especially coming out of residency, flip, flip, where's the salary, right? Because Mm -hmm. you're looking at a number and you want to make sure that it's a certain number. Uh, You want that Mm -hmm. number to be as high as possible, but that's not really, you know, all of it at all, right? So not only just the number, you need to know what's the conversion rate, right? You need to know Uh how long is that initial number going to be there as well as 
if you, you know, after a while, when that number goes away, what happens afterwards? So um, let's mm-hmm. just kind of talk about the salary and how that can be misleading many times for an applicant. Oh, awesome. Well, I love talking about compensation. It's a big one. <laughs> so, right. When you start out, there's, you know, different ways they're set up. One, you can be on a first year income guarantee with a hospital that kind of promises right. you a certain amount of money. That's pretty common in people coming out. Or they just might offer you a flat rate salary for the year one, right? Just get you on your feet, you know, train up, get, you know, get a patient base, and then you flip to production. It's not as common that you're going to go right out of the bat on production unless you're experienced and you have like a panel of patients who are kind of, they're going to follow you. But, you know, typically in that base year, you know, that's well and good, but man, that year goes fast and you're going to flip into production. And what does that RVU number look like? And is it the, in the range that you want? I always tell doctors, man, you have got to go pull every string you have, go to your county medical society or whatever hospital or training program or residency coordinator and find the MGMA numbers, you know, be like, dude, can you get me this range? I want to know where your salary falls in the MGMA numbers. Is it 50th percentile? Is it 70th percentile? Is it 80th? You know, sometimes doctors don't know they're really getting paid 40th percentile and that is not acceptable. And you got to move that number up. And the good thing about having evidence and facts is when you go interview, the worst thing to say is like, well, uh, my buddy, that orthopedist got this. And I think I deserve that, you know, and they're like, who do you think you are hotshot? But if you come in and you say, all I'm asking for is fair market value. And this number you've presented to me is 30th percentile of MGMA, which really isn't fair market values. All I'm asking for is market. Boom. You've got evidence to support it. You're going in strong. They know you're smart and they know you can negotiate because that is what you're trying to get. And then when you look at that RVU number, Man, I, not everyone's paid on RVU. This is the problem with compensation is there's like seven different ways that you can get paid. Right. And so, you know, you finally learn one and then you're like, oh, wait, they're paying me just on volume. And I don't know how much that means. And they're not converting it to RVU. So mm-hmm. in general, you want to make sure that if they're paying you based on production, you need to get some examples and just some due diligence of their financials to find out what similar doctors are making for that. Because you don't know, you know, if they say, well, you're getting $50 per RVU and this is your expectation. Has any doctor hit that? Is that a number that's right. impossible to hit? Is <laughs> it, is it like you're yeah. having a ski day and you can make it, or do you have to work your butt off to make that number? You know? And so that's something you want to ask around. You want to look at the financials and figure out what's the average salary of the doctors in this group. So I kind of know around there because man, there is no similarities. I look at contracts every day and these comp provisions are all over the map. And if you're going to have a bonus, and I, I tell you, some of them are so complex. I don't know who writes these. Like I'm a lawyer. And if I don't understand it, it's Business very complicated. Or... <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know what like yeah. rocket science here writes these things. Yeah. It's a complicated formula and it, it this and then a by factor of this. Ridiculous. Like it needs to be understandable by everyone. How do you get your bonus? Above this number, you get X. And then there's a tier. You know, it's got to be really clear, understand. And I push back a lot to say, I'm sorry, this is too complicated. And we need to really make it easy to understand because if you don't know how you're getting paid, then you're just blind and they can just pay you anything. And what I can't stand is vagueness. So this is the one time that you have to negotiate it. Once you sign it, you're done. There's no other opportunity. So if you don't know, you know, what these numbers mean or how you're going to get that bonus, then you need to start asking questions and figure out, you know, what is this bonus based on? Because right now it says quality metrics, or it says bonus is based on performance expectations. That's too vague. You know, what does that mean? What is number of visits per year that you got to hit? What performance metrics? What are you going to be expected? Are they impossible? You know, also, if you're paid, let's say, you know, productivity minus expenses, and they don't get into the detail of what the expenses are, and then all of a sudden they're taking 65% of your money, and you're like, what? And they're like, well, you know, overhead. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I'm an employed provider, and I'm only in my fifth year of practice, and I'm splitting the overhead for these partners? That seems <laughs> wrong. But yet yeah. you don't know because your contract's so vague. So that's when you really need to get down and dirty and say, I need to have a cap on that, right? You're not going to take more than... And then you can do what the heck you want to with your 40%. But I need to know how much is taken out of my money. And so that that's really a kicker. I spend a whole video just talking about compensation and how to understand it and how to negotiate it. And it's not personal. I try to tell doctors all the time, get the emotion out of it. It's just business. And you don't go in there and tell them you deserve more or you you need more because you're 
you know, highly trained or you went to Harvard, you go in there and talk about market value. And I need to understand how I'm going to get this bonus. And is there a way if I work really, really hard, then I can do really well. Yeah, no, you that's know? great. You advice. want to put some skin in that game. Absolutely. So what would you say is the number one important piece that you're looking at when you're going into a contract? Well, first of all, my number one advice that I give doctors, that's not really what I look at, is slow it down. Because many, many times contracts are like docu-signed and sent to a doctor right. saying like, here's a contract, you can review yeah, it if you want, click, blah, click, blah, click. blah. But yeah. anyway, you need to have yeah. it back in 24 hours, you know? And so they just believe it and they just sign it because they think, ah, I have to. Nothing is that fast. You can always say, I need a week or two to have my lawyer look at this. <clears throat> it's not unprofessional to ask for time to sit there and digest this agreement that you're binding to your life in the next couple right. of years. You know, it's a big commitment. So slow things down. The first thing I look at is usually the term, of, how long is this contract and how do you get out? Right. And that back door man is the number one thing I look, how do you get out? Because you're going to call me in two years and you're going to have a heart attack because your wife had a baby and she wants to live closer to mom and all these things are <laughs> happening and you didn't anticipate. And this was your dream job. And this is where you knew you'd stay until life happened. So how do you get out? And how painful is it that you're getting out, right? What's uh, So my the way I operate is when I look at a contract, I try to clear my head, put my blinders on and say, okay, let's look at this agreement. I write a lot of notes. I tell my client, this sucks, or this is good, or you know these things you might want to consider or be aware. Because a lot of times there's these little weird nuggets in there that really right. come surprise doctors, right? There's a little provision that says, oh, by the way, if you leave within the first year, you have to pay us $20,000. And that's just like stuck in there. And they're like, what? And so I just kind of highlight those things that can really kick you in the tail. And then what I do is I sit down and I go, guys, we're going to pick our battles. We're not going to fight every little Everything. thing. I'm not going to reword it to be like, they're too poor, or I don't like the way they say, we need to add the word reasonable. I mean, if you bleed all over that thing, you're just going to piss away a job. So you need to really focus on what is most important. Getting out is most important, right? The salary, it really, really important. You know, you need to have the big ticket items, which are usually termination clause, compensation, and non-compete. Right. These are the things that bind you after you leave, right? Non-solicitation, non, you know, non-competes. Is there a tail that you have to pay? I mean, it breaks my heart when a doctor comes to me and they're like, I'm sorry, I have to pay an insurance policy that cost me $18,000. I had no idea that was my responsibility, but they signed the contract no and policy. it is their responsibility. Yeah. yeah, that tail policy can really kick you. So those are the big main three, right? I mean, also just what is going to hurt you in here, right? What is so vague that, you, you know, go through the termination provision. What can they fire you for? You know, is it things like hurting the reputation of the practice? Or if we don't feel like you're following our policies, can, we'll just terminate you immediately. Or is it stuff like you're going to lose your license, you're going to die, <laughs> you know, you're going to commit a right. felony? Because those things you can kind of know that you're not going to do. So, you know, you just really want to focus in on that, right? When I'm here, do I understand how I'm going to get paid? Am I going to treat fairly? What about call? You know, are you going to just be on endless call? Are they going to rotate right. it? Are you going to get paid for a call? Yeah. You're going to get paid for call. You know, yeah. I had one doctor who joined a group and they got paid because they had a hospital contract. So they get paid $1,500 per call. Doctor got nothing. And he was like, that's not fair. So yeah, you need to know that going in, it, you know, or maybe even just how many call shifts is part of my regular expectations. And then how much am I going to get paid if I go over and beyond that call and start taking over other shifts? So those are the big ones. Yeah. Now with non-compete, I know there's been some talks that, hey, non-compete's going away or non-compete can't really be upheld. Is that kind of a state by state mm -hmm. thing or what's kind of the current message about non-compete? Yeah, that's a really fun new topic that's just, the F, you know, as you know, um, the feds have come out with some regulatory you know, blinkers like, hey, we might, you know, the Federal Trade Commission might do away with non-competes and wouldn't that be great? Then I had a flurry of clients calling me like, oh, yes, really? <laughs> okay. I don't know if I really truly believe, you know, the news reports that are coming out that the government's going to like overhaul the entire country overnight. It's a state by state issue. You know, like California doesn't have non-competes. Oklahoma doesn't have non-competes. Some states do. Texas does. And so we really have to go with state law on the issue. And the rules are all over the map, right? Some, you have to have certain requirements. Some, you have to have a buyout. Others, you don't. So that's when you need to talk to your state lawyer. 
I think this is my guess. We'll see what happens with the feds. I think what they're probably going to do is start eliminating like nationwide non-competes, you know, big non-competes. I mean, you can't go between state, interstate commerce, probably tech companies or like, you know, lower income employees that have these huge non-competes. It like doesn't mesh. It's not fair. Highly paid physicians, it's more common to have a non-compete just because of the nature of the practice. Like they don't want you taking your patients and moving next door. So we'll see, we'll see how it shakes out. I think for the time being, if you happen to be in a state that has strong non-competes, don't think this one little, you know, news report or fact sheet from the government is going to eviscerate that. So you need, yeah, it's not going to go away tomorrow. It's going to be a trickling change that probably is going to flood through the states little by little. So they're really something you have to pay attention to. Absolutely. All right. So now let's talk about your new mission work with Guard My Practice. Let's talk about how you came about that and what it is and how people can utilize that, you know, in their day-to-day practice. Medical school taught you how to be a doctor. And then you got into the real world and realized there's a lot you don't know. Your contract may not be as good as you think. You have difficult colleagues. There are Medicare regs, administrators, difficult patients, charting. It's a lot, but it's okay. No matter if you started your own practice or if you work for another group, we are here to help. Hi, I'm Amanda Hill, founder of Guard My Practice. In my 20 years of being a healthcare attorney, I keep getting the same questions over and over. And I thought, why don't we share the answers with more people? So we looked at the most common problems that doctors face and distilled those answers down into small sessions that fit with your busy schedule. Guard My Practice provides doctors information from a highly experienced healthcare attorney in a way that's inexpensive, entertaining, and easy to consume. So let's walk you through a contract, a business deal, a difficult patient encounter. Grab a coffee and sit with us for just 15 minutes a week. You'll get answers to the toughest questions that I hear, and you get your yearly CME out of the way because it qualifies for 14 hours of CME for the year. If you want more information, please go to our website, guardmypractice.com and sign up today. Yeah, sure. So, you know, people call me and pay gobs of money by the hour. I'm sorry. I know that's expensive (laughs) to hire me. But, you know, solve their problems, right? Okay, so what, what's happening, though, is I was answering the same questions over and over and over. And I thought, yeah, as lucrative as this is, I'm not feeling like I'm serving the world. And so how can I teach these doctors these things before they have to hire me, right? Because the goal would be that you hire a lawyer because you're really in a jam and you absolutely need the help, not to give general advice on how to stay out of trouble. And so I decided, what do I like the most? Well, this I like getting in face to face with doctors, helping out, giving this advice. Like I could do this all day long. I give speeches to doctors all across the country and I could just stay and have drinks and just keep talking because I really enjoy helping. And so that's when it turned on to me. Yeah, I'm going to start making these training videos. And so it's this idea that was just born. And I turned a room in my house into the film studio and I just started cranking them out, you know, Um, hired a film crew did the work, uh, made a year's worth of videos. Um, they're 15 minutes each. They qualify for CME. So it's kind of a win-win, right? You just ask your employer to pay for it. You got right. CME money. That's awesome. um, but it's something, everything you need to know, basically, in the lifespan of a doctor, from negotiating your contract and a lease, which people forget about, you know, to how to deal with employees. What about partners that you might not agree with? What about compliance? And how about audits? And what about fraud and abuse? You know, I say stark and anti-kickback and doctors are like, their eyes roll back in their head. Like, I don't know anything about that. You know, that sounds like a foreign language. So like, how can I dummy this down and explain the anti-kickback statute to you in 15 minutes, you know, or maybe the top three areas that you're going to get in trouble for billing. But this is what the government is going after you for. So let's not do these three things. It's not everything, but it's like the main thing. So I just go through, and then at the very end, it talks about transitioning your practice, you know, joining joint ventures, mergers, um, maybe burnout. And then I have some funny ones about, you know, dealing with difficult patients, finding joy again, you know, finding humor in work. And, you know, so it's just like the lifespan. I love it because I feel like I went through the whole career of a doctor and just tried to train them on all the pinpoint things that can go wrong, because these are what people call me about. 
you know, and this is what I get, you know, these are people get people in trouble and they have to pay me to get out of their jam. Um, and then sometimes they just come because, you know, I got so many questions on insurance, for example, where doctors right. would be like, do what, what kind of, I know, I know I need professional malpractice insurance. What are all these other insurances? And I'm not an insurance broker, but I've dealt with it enough to where I know, okay, let's talk about life insurance. Let's talk about cybersecurity. That really helps Disability you from a different insurance. perspective. <laughs> Disability insurance, because you're the life of the blood of your family. Typically, the doctor is the primary breadwinner. Not always, there's husband and wife teams. But, and so if you, you know, are disabled, then your family doesn't have income. So you got to protect that. So we go through that. So, you know, just all the things I could think of that hurt a doctor, I made a video on. And that's what I'm doing now. It's really fun. I'm still a lawyer. I'm still very busy in the practice, which is, it's just giving me stories to be honest. I, I just get stories from my clients and I turn them into video training, you know? So it's kind of fun. Sometimes my clients don't know I do it. And then sometimes I go, you know, I have videos that talk about this and you can save a lot of money. <laughs> and right. I go, oh, we didn't know. So they become guard my practice subscribers. So it's pretty fun. And I really encourage all of you because it's because I'm passionate about it. Like I really want to help you succeed. And to, you know, residents, I feel like residents aren't trained well. In fact, one of my goals is to try to bring this training to residency programs because I think that they're trained so yeah, well in awesome. medicine. And then they get out and they don't know how to negotiate. They don't know anything about their contract. They're totally overwhelmed. They don't know the business side. You know, finances stump them. They start to start their own practice without any training. And so that's unfortunate. And we've got to do better. So with your program, you look, you subscribe, you get the videos. Is there any conversation back and forth or is there any kind of interaction? No, otherwise you'd have to pay me a bunch of money. So <laughs> it's, uh, so eight, seven, it's 879 yeah. Yeah, yeah. for the year. And you get 48 videos for that, for that price. So it's like a one price you subscribe, you can binge watch them just like Grey's Anatomy, or you can watch them one per week, but they stretch out for a long time and it's 14 hours of CME. And sometimes doctors pick and choose, you know, let's say they're in a certain part of their career where like six or 10 of the videos are really, really helpful. They're not interested in the others because they already, maybe they don't need to renegotiate their contract and they're in a good place, right. but maybe they're having problems with sexual harassment at work and they really want to hear that video. So it just covers a broad gamut. and. At the end of the day, you know, I just, I'm a writer on the side. I didn't know if I should share that, Jim, but I write a lot of humor and I find that the more humor you put in the world and the more joy you put in the world, it, like it doesn't end. There's not like a set amount and then you run out, you know, you don't have anything funny to say. You keep writing, you keep putting it out there. It keeps coming. And that's what I feel about helping, you know, doctors, you just keep training, you keep helping. It comes back. That's the attitude I've had when I started this company. Now it is a company and I don't want it to you know, go bankrupt over it. But it's certainly something that has a real, a lot of passion behind it. Absolutely. And I think one thing, entrepreneurship is about solving people's problems, right? So the more right. problems you can solve, the more money you're going to make. And I think that it's awesome the fact that you said, hey, I keep getting asked these same questions, similar to the same thing with physicians. Every time you walk in a room, you're going to get questions about, hey, what's the best weight loss or what's the best you know, procedure yeah. to be done for this? Make a video about it. You know, that's the way that you can become the authority by using your voice and reproducing it so more people can hear it. So I think that's awesome. And I, I hope you know, so. I, and, you know, you know I was going to say, you know, contracts are really boring for classes, right? But the fact that you have, like you said, you mix in humor with it, it makes it tolerable to sit down and listen to versus if somebody was just reading, okay, let's go to page three of contract and we're going to review this. Who's going to really <laughs> you know, listen to something like that? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's very rare that like, I hear a lot like, well, you're not a normal lawyer. I'm like, well, I don't know what a normal lawyer looks like. I don't wear suits yeah. or hoodies most times. So I guess so, right. <laughs> but it is, you have to make it fun and entertaining. And, and I have a lot of crazy stories, you know, like the one time the doctor took his pants off, you know, I don't know, whatever. I have so many fun things, so many things to pull from because I've done this for so long. And here's the deal. I think people forget we are human beings. Like, you know, you are like, oh, I can't believe I can't keep a straight face. And like this patient, I can't get, get it together. And I'm a failure because this patient's pissing me off. Of course they're pissing you off. You know, you've just seen 20 patients that are sick and irritable. You know, you've got crap going on at home. You've got kids that have a baseball game you just missed. I mean, you're human. And I just want doctors to cut themselves some slack, you know? I don't think people understand the day of a life of a doctor. When they come in, they want your full attention. They want, look at my arm, look at my injury, look at my face, treat me with respect, act like I'm the only person in the world. And you're like, oh my gosh, you have no idea what my real life is like. I'm going through a divorce. I have this stuff going on, whatever. 
And, you know, it's so hard. You're, you're eating lunch in like 8.2 minutes. You know, you're right. squeezing in call before. And so I think it's just really good reminder to have a community, right? To have a group where you're like, we did it. We know how hard this is. You're, we're going to make it. But cheer each other on because it's real isolating sometimes, especially right. in like when you're solo or you're like isolated in this department all on your own and you feel like no one else is going through it and you must be a failure because man, I'm just like you guys when it comes to being a perfectionist. Doctors and lawyers are driven to the point of insanity, right? We want to be the best. We want to be liked. We want to be good at everything we do. And when a patient doesn't like us, you know, it sets our whole day. I had an interventional yeah. cardiologist, one of the best interventional cardiologists in the country, head of surgery, calls me almost in tears because this patient filed a board complaint against him. I was like, God, he's a nutcase. Like, don't worry about it. It's not the, it doesn't mean that you're a bad doctor, but he was like, how could he do this to me? And, you know, because I play counselor so often, right. I hear the, the vulnerable side of a provider because it's confidential and I'm I'm their person. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to have that person that you can call and be like, this is BS. I know it totally is. And you're valid. And we get a lot of board complaints and a lot of Yelp reviews that just piss off doctors. But you know what? If you don't have anybody to talk to about that, you do feel like you're alone. You feel like you're the only one that's going through it. And I think part of these videos, it's like she did an entire video on that. Like, I don't know the only one that dealt with that. I didn't know anyone else was going through it. And I think that in of itself is a help. Absolutely. And you brought up a big thing, bad reviews. Do you have a video oh, on yeah. bad reviews? I do. I do have a video on bad reviews. That's worth the subscription because that comes up so many times when I'm talking to colleagues. Yeah. Somebody's mm -hmm. like, look, I just got this one star review. You know, I've been treating this patient. I did everything right. You know, they got mad because they came in and the secretary said, you know, that you owe me money, which you do. And now they yeah. want to give you a one star <laughs> review. What do I do? So what do you yeah. advise people when they say, hey, what do I do? Mm -hmm. How can I get this review taken down? Man, that's the worst because it tanks your whole average, you know, and then you're like, oh, it's like 4.8 stars and now I'm done. To... So here's the deal with reviews. We are in a slap happy complaining culture right now. I don't know why we're going through this little phase in our lifespan where everybody complains about everything. And I think that consumers realize that for every 10 great reviews, you're going to have one weirdo bad one. Okay. So people are smarter authentic. than you think they are. You know, they're authentic. People are smarter than you think they are. So when they look at reviews and it's like, this guy's honest and genuine, he spends time with me. And then that front desk person treating me like garbage. He's great. He's kind. He's loving. You know, you're going to filter out that one bad one. So just keep that in perspective that if all of your reviews are amazing and you have a couple of bombs, people automatically go, that's an outlier. All right. That's dumb. I'm not going to look at that one bad review because that person, you know, was is a weirdo. So they, they self-select. And if, as long as most of your reviews are good, I don't worry too much about the bad ones. Now, here's the thing that pisses doctors off. You can't respond even if they're lying. You can't get into HIPAA, right? You can't say, yeah. you that did not happen. We yeah. operated on you. We did everything right. You're an idiot. And so you can't yeah, even say they came to your office, right? So the main response that I usually advise is something like, it's just customer service. It's more like, we're so sorry that you are unhappy. And we would love to help talk to you about that. And here is our office manager's name. And can you please call our office and we will talk that through. You're not giving HIPAA information. You're not saying PHI. You're not getting into their issue. It's not even for them because they're a weirdo who complains about everything. It's about the people that are reading. That's who you're talking to. You're talking to the person that goes, man, look how sweet and kind yeah, that response was, kindness. right? Film with kind. That is so respectful. And that does not sound like a clinic that this guy described. And so respond with a customer service response. Now, if it, every once in a while I get these reviews removed, but only if they like name call or if you find out they weren't actually a patient, that can get them re you know review removed. But every review site has terms of service. You, you go find them buried in the ether, you know, go click on enough buttons, you'll find terms of service. Right. And most terms of service, they things like you can't be harassing, you can't curse, you can't make things up. And so if you can catch one and there's a few that violate those, then you can get those removed and you email the service and you go, well, I can't say this in the public eye because it's PHI, but they never were a patient of ours and they never were in. It was maybe their family member or their cousin and, their, and they didn't see us. So they're lying when they said they had a bad experience or they're cussing it out and they're harassing this doctor or maybe they're like a racist or a freak show and they're just making this about personal. Sometimes you can get those removed. One time I had a doctor who was like a, you know, a, obvious, an, a vaccine proponent 
and a lot of anti-vaxxers came in. And so he made his opinions known, which again, don't get political with your patients, but whatever. And so he was really, he was, you know, political about who he voted for, he was political about vaccines. He kind of spouted off and they got really mad. And they, this whole anti-vax like group came after him and they blasted him with reviews. It was just horrible. And first of all, I was like, oh, crisis communication, we got to deal with this. But secondly, it's like, these aren't even patients, right? They're just like Facebook groups that are just firing reviews on you. So you can get those taken off. But for the most part, take a breath, you know, try to fill it with good reviews. And any patient that writes a good review, it's like a win, you know, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. Now, I kind of hesitate when I tell them, I don't like beg people for reviews or like put it in front of them and like give them incentives for reviews. That's creepy. But if you have a ton of good reason, one bad one, don't worry about it so much. You know, I try to explain that to doctors, give a good customer service response. And if it's total trash and get it removed, otherwise they will get buried eventually, right? The new reviews come in, the one-star reviews get hidden. And then there's like two one-star reviews, mostly four and five stars. So I just think you have to take it with a grain of salt. And like you mentioned before, as a physician, we take each patient encounter to heart, you know, we each review, we're like constantly judging ourselves by each encounter, which is not fair, number one, but that's what we tend to do. And you just have to really, at the end of the day, like you said, this one bad review, you know what you did. Don't yeah. let that worry you. And like you said, keep doing good work and keep collecting good reviews and it'll get buried. So, well, and the sad part I've seen lately is, you know, it's one thing to write a Yelp review. Like, first of all, I don't, I've never gone on Yelp <laughs> to say, did I see Dr. So-and-so? I don't know. Most people really don't think about reviews as much as the doctor worries about it. I mean, if usually physicians are by referral and if your friend refers, you're not going to go double check them on right. WebMD or whatever. So most people generally don't use reviews as the guiding light of what doctors they see. But sometimes people, instead of just doing a Yelp review, they go to the board. And when you get a board complaint, that's a whole nother ball game, right? That's your license on the line. Right. And I right. think that's where justifiably doctors get pissed because they're like, this is, it's one thing if they want to go blab out, you know, some bad experience on Facebook group. But when they start telling the medical board that I screwed up and I have to answer to that. And I just dealt with that a couple of days ago, an endocrinologist who is not a family practice doctor, you know, just has this busy, busy schedule booked out months in advance. Some patient calls wanted a refill immediately. She wouldn't come in. You know, she's just so pissed that she, you know, doctor wasn't there right then. It was literally like lunch hour. The doctor ended up calling her back within two hours, called out a 30 day refill, told her to come back. She needed to do labs, you know, and she felt a board complaint against my doctor. It's like, what? This doctor was like almost in tears. She's calling me like, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I did everything right. I'm like, of course you didn't do anything wrong. Nothing you did was wrong. This is insane. So I've done this. I've been a good doctor for 15 years. I've never had a complaint. It's very so, hard to have these complaints against you. And you just have to separate yourself from it and go, it's not me. I mean, you know, this person obviously has these anger issues to go fire off board complaints to my medical board because she didn't get a refill in an hour earlier that she expected. I mean, that's not, that's not sane. And of course they're going to get dismissed right? The boards don't come after doctors for that kind of stuff. So you just have to wait it out, get the dismissal letter and just say, it's part of the job. You know, just like when sometimes doctors come to me and they say, why am I having this employment issue? Why well, I'm a, this is a medical practice. We don't need this nonsense. Why is this nurse like going to the workforce commission or like arguing over overtime? I don't have time for this. It's like, right. this is part of business. You know, you yeah. work with human beings. That's part of the deal. You need to just absorb that and say, okay, part of the job. And so all of these things are unfortunately just the negative part of the job. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think hopefully that will relieve some stress that we keep ourselves under about the constant patient to patient opinions and, you know, wow, sure. how is this going to shift my whole lifestyle and my whole practice? So yeah, thank you for yeah. sharing that. All right. So time out with the sports doctor, this is your final time out. So, you know, number one, thank you for sharing. This has been an awesome episode. And I think the guard, my practice that you built um, it's going to really impact the healthcare environment in general, especially the education piece that you're doing. And, you know, somebody's sitting there saying, wow, uh, she's already done it. I can't do it. You know, and we many times we second guess ourselves. But what did you have to overcome? Because you're already been in practice for 20 years. And then you say, you know what, I want to start something new. What did mm -hmm. you have to overcome as far as imposter syndrome or whatever to do what you're doing now? That is such a great question. In fact, I have a surgeon and, and we're both like, 
in entrepreneurs, you know, I'm a lawyer, she's a surgeon, but we both kind of act as a sounding board for each other. That imposter syndrome is real. Like if I'm a 20, you know, almost 22 year health lawyer who has a lot of knowledge and I've done this and I think, oh man, I suck at this. You know, what was I thinking? How many times have I laid the minute going, what was I doing? Why did I start this? You know, I could have just been happy in my law firm and I could have just been happy with that. Why did I start this whole another thing? And yet, you know, when you get to the other side of it, and you start selling and it starts being extra income and you realize, okay, my vision, trust your vision. I think that's what I'm saying. And that's what we have to tell like each other that. when we're in the throes of the bad situation where it's like, we're not selling enough. We really thought this would be more popular really early on. It's just, you had that vision back like two years ago for a reason, right? You have that gut feeling. that's like, do this. This is needed. You're going to solve a problem in the world. And I kid you not, this is how I feel about it, Derek. But I just, I feel that if five people watch this videos and it solved their problems, like, you know, it's just like if you help one person, right? I mean, it's still valuable. So I don't care at the end of the day, I don't want to go broke, but I don't care how successful it is as long as it helps the people that watch it. And I, maybe that is a lesson for when you start something. You're like, well, am I helping anyone? So maybe it's worth it. Maybe that one person that I saved is going to save humanity, <laughs> not to be a video game, but you know, it's never know. So you just have to look at that like instinct. It's like, I had this instinct for a reason. I happen to be a very faithful person. So I'm like, if I have these yearnings and these leanings, I follow them because I feel like there's a reason for it. So that's, I think that's my advice. It's just really got to trust your gut. Yeah, I like that. And you know, that's the same thing starting a podcast. Who really wants to hear what I have to say? You know, somebody said, why do, should I write a book? Everybody has this story. There's right, plenty of doctor right. stories, but it's not your story. So, you know, I encourage people to share your story because your story is going to be told. Like we're talking about with the reviews, it's going to be told one way or the other. Either you give your version or other people will interpret what they think. So, Absolutely. Like there's always books. Yeah, there's always podcasts, but not yours. And right. you're giving them your unique perspective on your journey. So I think it's great. I love the creative side too. And that fuels a lot of people differently from practicing medicine. You know, it's the creative, the coaching and the entrepreneurial side. You know, they're giving advice on weight loss and products and all that fun stuff. It's different. It uses a different part of your brain. So I encourage you to not minimize that, that importance of that. So thank you for having me. This is just, as you can see, I just love talking about it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, this is great. And tell people how they can follow Guard My Practice, follow you, how they can get in contact with you if they want to work one-on-one. I just oh, yes. Say. I'd love to be on all of your podcasts. Um, so guardmypractice.com, super easy to find me. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm every, you know, everywhere there's socials, you'll find Guard My Practice. But reach out to me, send me a DM, you know, hit me up because I'd love to speak more. Um, lots of topics we haven't even gotten into today that we could probably spend 45 minutes just talking about. So yeah. there's a lot in the life of your practice and it's really fun to sort it out and figure it out. And then at the end you go, I'm so glad I know that now. You know, that's a really good feeling. Thank you. So guardmypractice.com. Perfect, perfect. And I'll share that in the show notes. Thank you once again for coming on and adding value to this podcast. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episodes. Until later, peace. Hey, time out with the sports doc. Right in the game, we ain't never stopping. You are now tuned in. Trust you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.